Hi everyone, this is Professor Hai Nguyen again, and I want to welcome you to my tutorial video for um, your second midterm, right? This is your second exam, and um, in this video, I'm going to try to keep it short because I hope by now you understand um, the test format, so I don't need to go over that um, in terms of the technology component. I don't need to go over that either because, again, if you took the first midterm um, and you received the grade on it, uh, basically means you you know how this exam works by now, right? And what I'm hoping for is that um, you take into consideration my feedback um, from midterm number one as you prepare for midterm number two in terms of the, the sophistication of your analysis, the type of details that ultimately um, that comes with your writing, um, the key terms that come from the reading and from the modules and how you somewhat all put it together. So that's basically the holistic approach that I take in terms of grading your essays, if you will, right? It's, it's, it's content, it's, it's documents, it's key terms, the level of details, and how sophisticated your writing is. So that's in a nutshell, guys. So um, this is the second midterm. So what I want to focus now is just purely on the content. So that way I can get you on your way to start preparing for midterm number two. Now, again, the format is the same, all right? Um, it's a document-based question exam. And ultimately, um, this time, what uh, part of American history we're covering? We are covering American history um, from the 1920s all the way up to World War II, right? So we, we got three decades, if you will, 1920s, 1930s, and ultimately 1940s. That's what you're looking at. And we're covering, um, the chapter reading, chapter uh, 23, 24, 25 in the textbook. And we're also gonna be covering module um, six, seven, and eight, right? Just so three modules, right? Three decades, uh, um, pretty simple in terms of the content and the timeline. And uh, I hope you enjoy what you learn in the modules. Module six, seven, and eight. In module six, you kind of looked at somewhat that cultural tension uh, um, divide uh, in the 1920s, if you will, as as Americans were moving to more of a, a, a urban metropolis. And then on top of that, you have immigrants from decades before coming in. You have African-Americans migrating up to the north. You have also Mexican immigration across from the southwest. So you can see that America's demographic was changing. And if you know anything about American history is that any time when there is somewhat a demographic change or some kind of shift, right, there's always a reaction. And that's part of the reason why I assign somewhat in module number six for you to look at somewhat um, the, the, the backlash, the reaction to those demographic changes, if you will, uh, and, and, and the, the um, urban somewhat uh, uh, land, uh, the, the shift to more of an urban landscape. So you have urbanization, immigration, Right. And um, the reason why I signed you module number six is because um, it's simply I'm trying to draw parallels with what's going on today in America. You can see the parallels that America today is rapidly changing, that that the demographics of America is getting darker and darker. Um, you have um, right now, majority of uh, American children in schools are, are children of color. And they estimate that by the year 2040, for the very first time in American history, um, white Americans will be uh, the minority group, if you will. Um, that is not to say that they're going to be the smallest group. Of course not. Uh, it's simply because by 2040, if you add up all the color people, if you will, we will be the majority. So um, that's part of the reason why I asked you to look at module number six, right? To see that backlash, if you will, that xenophobic, somewhat racist backlash, right? From the Ku Klux Klan and ultimately from, from the eugenics movement, right? And, and ultimately that cultural divide between America. And that's why I asked you the question, what does it mean to be an American? Because again, uh, what it meant to be an American for the longest time has always been summarized in four letters, if you will, white, Anglo, Saxon, Protestants. But as the demographic of America is changing, um, yeah, there is a backlash to kind of just restore somewhat uh, what it means to be an American in a traditional sense, right? So that's in module number six. Uh, module number seven, um, I had you looked at um, Mexican immigration. I had you look at somewhat... Uh, um, uh, the Mexican American community in America, right? Um, starting in the 1920s, because America's need for labor, yes, because America somewhat closed the door to European immigration and also Asian immigration, they still need labor, right? So this is where you have the heavy influx of Mexicans coming through the Southwest, 
uh, um, really because of World War I, right? Um, you have some opportunities and also the 1920s, the American economy is booming. So you have somewhat economic uh, uh, um, mobility, but that also means that you need somebody to fill in that, that lower, you know, agricultural, uh, low skill uh, um, type of jobs, if you will. And that's where ultimately the Mexicans come in, right? So um, I always describe in my class, America kind of has this uh, um, yo-yo or, or almost kind of like schizophrenic uh, relationship with somewhat uh, or, or Southern neighbors, if you will, is that when things are good, you know, we, we ask the Mexicans to, or we recruit the Mexicans to come over. And when things are bad, ultimately, um, we try to deport them, right? Uh, America try to deport them and vilify them as job takers and moochers, if you will. So that's why I had you look at module number seven, right? Looking at that Mexican repatriation program, ultimately the various efforts um, to try to get rid of Mexicans as a way to open up more jobs for white workers. And um, module number eight, I had you looked at uh, the Japanese internment camp, right? I, it, that's simply it, right? Uh, the Japanese internment camp, right? In terms of how America felt dealt with somewhat a, a group of people that because of their race, uh, um, was simply accused of being um, spies, right? Um, disloyal and ultimately uh, en enemies, right? Um, these are the Japanese Americans, even though they're born in America, they identify themselves as American citizens, if you will, simply because of their race by the 1940s, by the attack of Pearl Harbor, you have more than 120,000 Japanese Americans uh, being rounded up and being sent to the camps. Uh, it is a prison, guys, ultimately designed to detain and ultimately uh, uh, keep America safe from what it perceived to be somewhat um, enemy spies, right, um, if you will. So that was in module number eight. So that's ultimately what you have learned in the module. And the reason why I'm emphasizing so much about the modules, it's simply because in this exam, you will have to somewhat review the modules again very carefully in terms of the content that you will need in order for you to be successful for this second exam because for the second exam um some of the content will come from the reading but not so much because if you look at somewhat the reading um the 1920s and the 1930s and ultimately world war ii look i'm not really big on military history so it's not that i don't have respect for people in the military or anything like that but at the end of the day um i am more of a social historian and and i i am more fascinated about looking at american history from somewhat a bottom down perspective and, and uh, simply because um, that wasn't really somewhat my, my interest back in somewhat um, uh, my college years, if you will, right? So it, it's not my strength, but at the same time, um, look, if you're interested in military history, there is so, so, so much documentaries that is done on every single battle, every single war you can think of. So guys, this is part of the reason why I, I don't really somewhat focus on military history in terms of this class, because there's just so much material written on it that you can read. And guys, plenty of Ken Burns documentaries that you can go through. So if you have Netflix, there you go, right? Uh, World War I, World War II, the Vietnam War. The, so look, you can learn all about the war aspect if you will. So part of it is that if you look in your textbook, yeah, a lot of it has, if you look at chapter 23, it talks a lot about war battles, right? So um, make a long story short, um, yeah, for midterm number two, a lot of the content you're going to have to analyze that are relevant to midterm number two is actually going to come from the modules, right? And a little bit from the reading. Because why? I'm not asking you, right, uh, um, uh, what mobilization was for World War II. Right. I'm not asking you what caused the Great Depression. I mean, guys, that is so played out. And, and <laughs> I have asked that question before in my in-person class. And it actually is risky because a lot of students, they get lazy. So they just Google random stuff like what caused the Great Depression. And they always come up with the simplest answer. The stock market crash, the stock market crash. So you know what? I just decided I'm not even going to ask that question. If you're interested in the New Deal, again, guys, there is just so many documentaries on the Great Depression that you can watch and you can learn. And I'm pretty sure you have learned the Great Depression before. So I'm not gonna ask you about the Great Depression in terms of what caused it. I think that's very high school-ish, right? This is a college course. So ultimately we're trying to look at American history in a more in-depth, uh, somewhat uh, uh, um, 
level, if you will. And and at the end of the day, I'm I'm trying to hope that in this class, we're I'm 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 trying to give you different perspectives, different topics on American history to kind of keep things relevant. And I'm hoping it's relevant to you, right? So I'm not going to ask you what the cause of the Great Depression is, right? The stock market. I, I, no, right? I'm not asking you that. And in terms of the 1920s, yeah, I'm not going to ask you about the roaring economy of the 1920s, right? I'm not going to ask you about somewhat, yeah, you know, uh, consumer culture during the 1920s. That's not what I'm asking you. All right, so let's talk about midterm number two. What am I looking for you to analyze? So let me pull up the screen here and let me pull up the documents. Very similar, guys, right? You are going to have to deal with um, the documents, right? So let me... Uh, minimize myself here okay so uh here's the midterm page as you can see here and here, here are the instructions on how you set up your computer but again guys you guys already know how to do that by now and of course if you're watching this video so you're good to go with a mandatory somewhat uh video guide test format um it's the same um as midterm number one guys no difference right um two hours right time limit 1000 words right uh, um based on somewhat modules i apologize there module um six to eight right module six to eight and ultimately this is what you're going to be graded upon right um your thesis your art or uh, your argument development your utilization of at least six documents right the sourcings of the documents are you able to understand the author's somewhat main objective the purpose the historical context and of course relevant information beyond the document so look i don't need to explain this to you you already did this before, so you know what I expect. So please look back at your midterm number one and take into consideration the feedback I provided to you. And please, guys, make the adjustment, okay? All right, so let's just dive right into it, all right? Um, let's talk about the documents. All right, so document number one, what you have here is ultimately, um, this comes from the great Charles Kikachi, right? And um, Charles Kikachi uh, was a Nisei, which means he's a american born but of japanese descent right so he's japanese american he's born here and the reason why i start off with document number one it's simply because i think it represents the theme that i'm trying to focus for midterm number two and also i think just the life of charles himself somewhat represent the the trials but also the opportunities and the disappointment that people of color felt during the time period that we are examining for midterm number two, right? From the 1920s to the 1940s. So a little background about Charles. Um, yes, he's Japanese American, actually from the Bay Area. Um, in the 1930s, he's an orphanage. Uh, he's an orphan, kind of jumps. Uh, he gets adopted into this multiracial family, if you will. But um, he goes to school and he wants to become a somewhat um, welfare worker uh, you know, in sociology, which was somewhat at the time viewed as women's work, right? Um, but he goes and he gets his degree from San Francisco State, uh, the school at the time, and um, he's looking to put his degree to work, right? It's 1939, and all of a sudden, everything changes underneath his feet. So document number one, is from his great diary that he wrote during his time um, in the internment camp. So again, you have already looked at the internment camps in module number eight, but here you have a piece of writing, uh, excerpts from um, Charles, um, his diary, right? The Chronicle from an American concentration camp. It was published in 1973, but he wrote it when he was in the internment camp. And if you read this document, number one, he tells you what just happened, right? What, what, what just happened that ultimately that has him shot, right? And I think you can just tell from the title, but if you read this, right? So something just happened that the Japanese American community and Charles himself, they're just shocked by what just happened and they're worried, okay? They're worried that ultimately um, what will happen to them and that despite all of their efforts to prove to America that they are Americans, right? Um, they are worried that ultimately America will perceive them to be enemies if you will. And unfortunately, um, Charles, he's not wrong. That America does see them as the enemy. And as a result, right, uh, more than 120,000 
Japanese and Japanese Americans are going to be rounded up and sent into the internment camps. And oh, by the way, guys, the internment camps itself, it wasn't just limited to just Japanese Americans within America. America actually welcomed and allow or at least made itself available to other countries if they wish to expel Japanese within their own countries. So for example, um, you had Japanese people in Peru, you had Japanese people in Panama, you had Japanese people from Colombia, all around the somewhat Western hemisphere. And unfortunately, America did not limit itself to just American borders, if you will, that you had more than 3,000 Japanese Latin Americans, right? These are Japanese uh, uh, living uh, in the Western Hemisphere, south of the Western Hemisphere, if you will, ultimately was also detained and imprisoned during World War II. So again, just a little factoid, if you will. But the reason why I'm assigning you this document, it's simply because um, it's a very interesting passage that, that um, I have selected. It's simply because you can see what just happened to the Japanese American community. But if you read the passage on July 14th, 1942, um, Charles is having a conversation with some of his friends in the camps. And ultimately, they are somewhat talking about um, their hopes, but also their disappointment and their disillusion with American democracy. Right? Some of them are questioning it. Right? Some still believe it. Some are questioning, if you will. And that's the reason why I'm signing you this, because I think it represents somewhat the themes I'm trying to focus on, is that American historians, we often point to World War II as a watershed moment. So let me explain to you what a watershed moment is. A watershed moment is basically a period, a time of great changes. Right? Historians often point to World War II as a time of great changes, if you will, that because of World War II, America commits itself to fighting democracy, if you will, and as a result, um, it has to live up to those promises. And the fact that it made promises of fighting for freedoms and equality, right? People of color, minorities in America, and this also includes women, guys, right? Um, they are going to use it as an advantage, as an opportunity to prove their worth and ultimately fight for their freedom and fight for their equality, right? The modern day civil rights movement in the 1960s would not have been possible if it wasn't for World War II. Some of the foundation, the ideological foundations, right, of the civil rights movement, of your rights as a citizen to be treated as equal and that America needs to somewhat, um, America needs to somewhat create a, a racial democracy, that, that, that a, a democracy that works for everybody, right? All people of, co of color. And also, if you think about it, World War II itself was also a very unifying experience in a sense that all people of color came together, united by a common cause to fight against the Nazis, to fight against the fascist Italians, and to fight against the Japanese imperialists. Uh, and ultimately, um, it was through that experience, right, that unifying experience of, of that common cause to fight against totalitarianism, right, imperialism and racism, that ultimately um, paved the way, right, provided a foundation for minorities in America in particular to really uh, fulfill those promises, right? But at the same time, um, there were limits to those promises during World War II. And ultimately, that's your task, right? Your task is to figure out why World War II was so important, especially for people of color, right? Um, and that also, uh, that also includes um, African-Americans, uh, Mexican-Americans, and in this case of Charles, of also Japanese-Americans. Not all changes are good, right? Uh, it's a little complicated. Uh, but I am trying to figure out, do you understand how World War II represented a change? Whether for good, whether for bad, right? Do you understand why it was somewhat a moment of change, a moment of transformation for so many groups, if you will? Now, I'm going to acknowledge something that, um, unfortunately, um, there just isn't enough assigned material in the textbook and also in the modules for me to somewhat test you on the experiences of women. 
So I'm gonna admit that your textbook does not do a good job of highlighting the experiences of women throughout this time period. Um, we will focus on women's quest for equality a little bit later on in the semester when we're looking at the equal rights movement, if you will. But I will acknowledge that, um, yes, in this exam, unfortunately, um, that, that's just one of the shortcomings. So we're not somewhat covering women. So I'm looking for you to understand how World War II was a change for minorities, African-Americans, Mexican-Americans, and ultimately also Japanese Americans as well, right? So that's what we're looking for. And I wanna emphasize something. In order for you to track change, you have to understand, well, what occurred or what life was like for these folks prior, right, to World War II, right? In order for you to track change, you need to understand, okay, what was their life like in the 1920s, in the 1930s, and ultimately, by the 1940s, what was it about World War II that represented such a change, right? So if you look at, uh, for Charles and Japanese Americans in particular, I don't think you can make an argument that much changed for them for good. I would say, if anything, it's quite the opposite, is that um, things only get worse for Japanese Americans. They were already viewed as somewhat competition. They were already viewed as outsiders and foreigners. And because this is prior to World War II, and once Pearl Harbor happened, um, things are only get worse, right? So it can get worse, if you will, right? Um, that's what you're looking at. So if you want to use document number one effectively, um, I highly recommend you go back to module number eight and review, right, the sources on the internment camps, but also in um, the Fred Korematsu case, because they do highlight the experiences of Japanese immigrants, where do they come from, how did they get here, right, and ultimately what life was like for them uh, uh, prior to World War II, just somewhat the context, if you will. So I highly recommend you go back to module number eight and review the content there, right, because unfortunately there's just very little content on the internment camp in your textbook, if you will. All right, so let's go to the next document, if you will, if you will. Okay, so document number two, um, document number two, what you see here, so this is a family of African Americans from the South. They have just arrived in the city of Chicago, the year is 1922, right? Very simple uh, picture, if you will. Um, nothing much to say, say here, but this is really me telling you that you need to examine, right, the Great Migration starting after World War I, right, that this great migration is going to continue beyond World War I. It's going to go through the 1920s, right? And all the way up to the 1940s, right? So you have African Americans leaving the South, right? You need to explain to me why are they leaving the South, right? What is pushing them to leave? And ultimately, what is pulling them to come to the North, right? And when they come to the North, what is their life like, right? What is their life like in the 1920s? in the 1930s, right? Uh, uh, what opportunities did they have? And ultimately, what challenges do they still face, right? So if you look at this picture, this picture is trying to ask you to look at what life was like for African Americans as they left the South and as they entered into the North. And once they enter in the North, what new opportunities did they have, right? It's not just in Chicago, guys, but the, the, guys, but the biggest city is in New York. It's in Harlem, right? The Harlem Renaissance, if you will. So I'm asking you to look at how by just moving away from the South, moving into the North, how does it provide new opportunities for African Americans and what impact does it have on the consciousness of African Americans in the North, right? Is it empowering, right? Uh, uh, do, it, does it embolden them? But also, just because you move to the North and there are better jobs, that doesn't mean that society still sees you as equal, right? Um, unfortunately, there is still going to be hatred towards African-Americans, if you will, especially in the North, right? So what challenges do they still face specifically, right? As they're moving to the North, if you will. So that's document number two. Um, document number three is actually a speech that was made by W.E.B. Du Bois. So let me pull it up here. All right, it's actually a speech made by W.E.B. Du Bois and it's called A Negro Nation Within a Nation. Now, the great W.E.B. Du Bois, this is the founder 
of the NAACP um, back in the early 20th century. He called upon African Americans. If you remember from your midterm of one, he called on African Americans to go serve during World War I as an opportunity for them to achieve equality. But even though World War I represented that opportunity, and even though African Americans migrated to the North, they left Jim Crow South, and they went into the North for better opportunities, if you will, something changed in the 1930s that ultimately even the great W.E.B. Du Bois himself becomes disillusioned with the promises of America, right? So I want you to read his speech, right? This was a speech that he made in 1934, right? Uh, in 1934 in New York City, and ultimately um, he summarizes the opportunities, but also the disappointment and the challenges that African Americans will have would face during the 1930s. And if you know anything about the 1930s, well, what changes, guys? Yeah, the economy collapsed, right? The economy collapsed. And as a result, you have massive unemployment. And there was a saying within the African American community that African Americans are basically the first to get fired and the last to get hired. And if you're asking yourself, well, why is that the case? Guys, simple answer. It's racism. That's what it is, right? I'm blunt, right? I don't like to sugarcoat things, right? Because the logic was ultimately, if you get rid of blacks, if you get rid of women, if you get rid of Mexicans, immigrants in the workplace, that will open up more jobs for workers in America. I hope that sounds familiar to you because that's what we have going on today. We have an administration that vilifies Mexicans as criminals and rapists and murderers and talking about how they're coming here to steal American jobs. It's no different, right? In the 1930s, if you will. So W.E.B. Du Bois is talking about some of the challenges and the impact that the 1930s, the Great Depression, had on African Americans. So I want you to analyze it. I want you to read what he has to say about somewhat uh, uh, the disappointment and also the challenges that African Americans face during the 1930s, that it seems like no matter what they do, they can't seem to get a leg up in life, right? So it's a setback, right? It's a setback for African Americans during the 1930s. So this is my way of letting you know, hey, look at chapter 24 and look at that passage in particular. It says, neglected Americans in the New Deal. Right? I want you to look at how the New Deal itself right, had an impact on African Americans. It's not good. Right? It's not good, if you will. Um, so yes, I want you to examine chapter 24 very carefully. And also, guys, understand that, that this is the beginning of the inequalities of black and white America. Um, or I don't want to say, no, I'm sorry, I take that back. It's not the beginning. It's only exacerbating. It's only widening right? That inequalities that exist within black and white America. Things were already bad before, right? Between black and white America, but you're going to have actually policies from the 1930s that makes it even worse, that the income gap, that somewhat the economic gap between black and white is going to get worse because unfortunately the New Deal itself is really only beneficial to white recipients, right? Um, part of the reason is that ultimately it's not that FDR is racist or anything like that. He sympathized with African Americans, but he had racist supporters, right? Southern Democrats, these are the Dixiecrats, right? They, they threatened to veto his New Deal measures if he threatens segregation. So he's a man of his time. He wants to get legislation done. And unfortunately, he has to start somewhat uh, compromise and strike um, a deal with racist Southern Democrats. We call it the Southern veto, right? By its name, if you will. So I want you to look at somewhat uh, this speech that he's talking about. Um, this is my way of letting you know, hey, you should examine how the Great Depression had an impact on African-Americans, right? So that's document number three. All right, document number four, what are we looking at? Um, this should be very familiar. This was something that you analyzed in module number seven, if I'm not mistaken right, on the Mexican repatriation program. This is just an image to highlight to you, to illustrate to you, right, of Mexican and Mexican-Americans. Yes, Mexican-Americans. America was deporting its own citizens, right, 
back to Mexico, if you will, right, as a way to try to create more jobs, okay? So yeah, it's plain and simple, guys. This is me of letting you know you need to start to think about what life was like for Mexicans and Mexican-Americans during the 1930s, right? During the 1930s, because why? In the 1920s, you got Mexicans coming over, right? Because we need their labor, the economy is booming, right? So you got half a million Mexican immigrants coming over to America during the 1920s, right? So we need their labor. Even though they're segregated in the barrios, living on their separated side of town, right? They are in America, if you will. But by the 1930s, well, something changes, right? America's relationship with Mexican immigrants in particular changes, right? And obviously, this is an example of that change, is that there is an effort to try to deport Mexicans out from America. And this also includes their American-born children. It is estimated that more than 60% of those who were deported, right, or at least left America in the 1930s, 60% of them were American-born children. Right, so this is my way of letting you know uh, um, you need to review and examine right Mexican and Mexican American right during the Great Depression. How did the Great Depression have an impact on these people? Right, so it's that simple, guys. That's document number four. Document number five has to do more with um, has to do more with um, Mexicans immigration and Mexican Americans during World War II. And this is why I describe it as a yo-yo or kind of like a schizophrenic relationship because what do you have? In the 1920s, we import Mexicans to come over to work, right? In the 1930s, America tried to deport them to push them out because they felt that Mexicans were taking jobs. And then all of a sudden, 1940s, well, that changes again. And this is part of the reason why we call World War II as a transformative or a watershed moment, right? Because World War II, what do you need? You need manpower, you need labor. Well, where are you gonna get it from if millions of white Americans and also black Americans and so many other Americans are off to war? You need labor. So where are you going to get it from? Yes, guys, I want you to review this video very carefully, watch the entire episode because it is going to look at somewhat the uh, Mexican importate the importation of Mexican workers during World War II, right? I won't say the program, but I'm hoping that you talk about it in your essay, okay? So I'm, I'm looking for that, but in this video, it is also going to talk about somewhat uh, Mexican Americans, veterans during World War II and their contribution and how they view World War II as an opportunity to fight for their freedom. So Look very carefully, review this source very carefully, guys. Do not skip this document. Do not skip this source, guys, because it is very important that you look at this because why um, you're gonna have to answer. It. A lot of content is gonna come from this video for your midterm. I'm just letting you know that right now. So do not skip document source number, uh, source number five, if you will, because it's gonna cover Mexicans during World War II, right? And unfortunately, your book, it has very little information upon that. So yes, you're going to have to review this uh, document very carefully, right? Watch the entire episodes. I think it's like 55 minutes, right? Uh, but I think it does a great job, if you will. That's document number five. All right, document number six is somewhat relevant also to document number five, right? Document number six, here you have um, an organization. It is a Mexican-American organization during World War II. Um, the League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC, as I like to call them, right? Or that's their acronym, LULAC. And what they're writing here is they're writing about the treatment of Mexican Americans historically and also during World War II, that despite the contribution and despite the sacrifices that Mexican Americans made during World War II, right? Um, they are somewhat disappointed. That, that despite all of the promises, despite right, all of the freedoms that were promised during World War II, Mexican-American veterans, they put their lives on the line. Right? They go overseas. They fight against the Nazis and, 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 and the Axis power, if you will. And they believe that they would be treated as equal. They believe that it would give them chance for equality. Right, only to come home 
and ultimately um, be viewed as second class citizens, right? So in this document, right, it is trying to address this contradiction that exists, that despite Mexican Americans trying their best, right, putting their lives on the line for their country, when they come home, ultimately, um, yeah, I'll let you read the document I'll, and I'll let you figure out how Mexicans were still perceived in America, if you will, despite them making a strong contribution during World War II, right? So that's document number six. And document number seven is actually very similar, guys, to document number six, but it has to do with African Americans, if you will, right? Um, this is the double V campaign. It was somewhat um, a campaign that was created by the Pittsburgh Courier, right, which is uh, an African-American uh, somewhat newspaper, if you will, but it was eventually adopted by the NAACP. And um, the image and why it's called the double victory is very simple. African-Americans are looking at World War II as an opportunity to fight for their equality, to fight for democracy to fight for their freedom, right? To fight for those ideals, right? To fight to promote democracy overseas, but also to earn democracy at home, right? So that's the double V campaign. It's very simple, guys. I'm asking you to look at African-Americans and their contributions during World War II, right? Victory overseas, right? And victory at home. They want to fight for freedom, they want to fight for democracy overseas and as home at, as well. So this is my way of letting you know you need to analyze uh, um, how World War II impacted African Americans and how did African Americans view World War II as an opportunity, as a chance for them to fight for their equality. So that's what I'm looking for, guys, and then, Document number eight. This is actually an article that looks at a forgotten history of the Detroit race riot, right, in 1943. And I'm assigning you this article. It's simply because I'm trying to highlight that contradiction and also that disappointment that people of color felt during World War II, right? That, that even though they see opportunities, even though they see freedom and democracy, right, on the horizon. Those are promises, right? But the question becomes is, what is reality for many of these folks? So if you look at African Americans, right, during World War II, it gives them a chance for jobs, right, to go into the North, right, to work in the war factories. And it gives them a chance to go to the West, to work in the war factories, if you will, to work in the shipyards right here in the Bay Area, guys, in Vallejo, right? But at the same time, despite the American government telling these people that they are fighting for freedom and democracy, right, their daily lives, I don't know if you can make an argument that is what they felt. There's a reason why the Pittsburgh Carrier and the NAACP is going to have to create that double V campaign, guys, because why? They were facing problems at home. I'm talking about African Americans. So I want you to read, right, Michael Jackman, his article to talk about somewhat the Detroit race riot, because I think it really highlights the contradiction, right, and the paradox that African Americans felt during World War II, that on the one hand, they are heightened by expectations of better opportunities, better jobs, freedom, right, equality, right? Democracy on the one hand, right? America is promising them that. But on the other hand, there is disappointment. There's disillusion because why? Same thing, guys. When African-American soldiers overseas, after done fighting World War II, when they come back home, I don't know if much change because why? Segregation is still the law of the land, right? You still have black water fountain, white water fountains, if you will. African-Americans still can't go eat at the same lunch counters, right, as white. African-Americans are still excluded from housing. African-Americans are still excluded from education, from college universities, right? So um, you can make an argument that despite the changes, despite them putting their lives on the line, when African-Americans come home, things are still the same, right? But 
We want to highlight the good. We want to highlight the transformation, if you will. So that's your job, guys. That's your job for midterm number two, right? You are trying to understand why World War II was so important for these groups, right? African Americans, Mexican Americans, and Mexican immigrants, right? And also uh, Japanese Americans as well. So those are the three groups that I want you to focus on. And in order for you to track change, right? In order for you to explain to me why World War II was so important and so significant, right? You have to understand what their life was like in the 1930s and in the 1920s. So you're gonna have to do a little backtrack because that's how you explain change, guys. Change over time, that's what history is, right? That's why I'm assigning you sources that's related to what? African-Americans in the 1920s, right? Uh, uh, Mexican-Americans in the 1930s, right? Mexican-Americans during the 1940s. Uh, uh, African-Americans during the 1940s, if you will. I'm asking you to somewhat track change over time and to explain to me why World War II is such a watershed, a transformative moment. But also, those changes, right? It has its limitations. It has its limitations, right? I don't want to make it seem like World War II was all unicorn and rainbows and everybody's holding hands and singing Kumbaya, guys. Yes, there is opportunities. Yes, there is promises of freedom and equality. But what is the reality, right? For Mexican Americans, for African Americans, for Japanese Americans, what is the reality for them on a daily basis during World War II? Are they treated any better, right? Are they treated any better, right? So what are the limitations to some of those somewhat uh, uh, changes, right, that occur and also the limitations of the promises that were made during World War II by the U.S. government, if you will, right? Um, so yeah, that's your task. I'm not going to give you the question like I did last time, right? You're going to have to do your preparation, guys, right? So make sure you set aside plenty of time to work on this project, right? To work on this assignment, right? Uh, get it in before the submission date, right? And this is, again, I'm just warning you right now that a lot of the content from this assignment for the midterm number two is actually going to come from the modules and it's going to come from the documents themselves that I'm assigning here. There's going to be somewhat very little information, right, in your textbook, if you will, that deals with midterm number two. Because why? We're just looking at African Americans, Mexican Americans, right, and Japanese Americans. That's what you're looking at. So as you're going through the reading, you got short low passages that looks at African Americans. So if you look at chapter 23, you have a segment where it talks about the new Negro, right? That's ultimately a key passage there. What you might want to do is also go back to chapter 22, where it talks about that great migration, right? So at the end of chapter 22, you have a short segment that talks about the great migration of African Americans moving into the North and also Mexican migration from the Southern border. So you might want to just jump back to chapter 22 and just kind of reread that little passage or at least review it, right? But guys, I'm telling you right now, you're going to have to do a lot of reviewing from the modules assignment, if you will, especially modules number seven and eight, right? Seven, eight is really crucial, guys. Um, you got a little bit of reading on African Americans during the Great Depression uh, in chapter 24, um, neglected Americans in the New Deal. So, so you might want to look at that passage, right? Review that very carefully. And also chapter 25, right? The Double V campaign. You're trying to understand that. And of course, you're looking at the Japanese internment camp, right? Um, yeah, don't worry so much about the, the military operations. So read that passage, uh, the wartime home front. That's what you want to focus on, right? So you got a little bit of reviewing of reading from the uh, textbook, if you will, but a lot of the content is going to come from the modules. And guys, I'm telling you right now, right? Document number five, you need to review that film. Right? You need to review that film and go to module number six as well. You need to review the Mexican re repatriation program. I'm looking for details here, guys. All right? So I'm just letting you know uh, it's going to come from the content, guys. Uh, I would say 85% is going to come from the modules right? and from the assigned sources here and the other 15% a little bit from the reading, from the, from the textbook. So 
Um, that's in a nutshell. And the themes that we're focusing on, right? Three groups, right? African Americans, Mexican immigrants, and Mexican Americans, right? And Japanese Americans, right? 1920s, 1930s, and World War II, right? Remember, why is World War II such a transformative watershed moment? In order for you to explain that, you have to put it in the context of what life was like for these people prior to World War II, 1920s and 1930s, right? That's how you're gonna track that change. But even when you identify that change, right? You have to explain, or at least you have to define the limitations, right? Of those changes, if you will, that, that ultimately, um, despite the promises of better, you know, of better opportunities, of better jobs and, and equality and freedom on a day-to-day -day basis, African-Americans and Mexican-Americans and Japanese-Americans, if you will, how were they treated, right? This is why document number eight, you need to read it very carefully, guys, okay? That's all I have to say for that one. So guys, best of luck, if you will. Set plenty of time, right, to prepare for this assignment, okay? set aside as much time as possible to review. And again, I hope this video has been informative to you, right? Uh, and, 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 and you find it helpful. I know the production value is very low and I know I somewhat have a very loud voice and I tend to somewhat ramble, but guys, I'm trying my best to give you as much information as you need. So if you have any further question in terms of how to prepare for this assignment, what concept, what key terms you need to focus on, ultimately feel free to ask me. I'm more than, uh, um, I'm more than happy to help whenever I can, guys. But on that, you have a lot of work to do, guys. So make sure, right, your essay is organized, it's detailed. And don't forget, guys, at the beginning of the test, read the question very carefully, guys. Read the question very carefully, right? Spend a couple of minutes at the beginning of the test to outline your essay, right, to figure out what your thesis is, to figure out what your body paragraphs are going to focus on focus on and then ultimately save a little couple of minutes at the end of the test to ultimately proofread your essay because again i have to be able to comprehend your content and your writing guys uh, uh, so make sure you set aside time for that as well okay but on that guys best of luck and let me know if you need help all right thank you very much guys bye